All right, I think we should go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining this year's AFTO Food Defense Committee meeting. As you guys know, most of the committee meetings, actually all of them are now virtual, um, all in the, this week and last week, and I think some are next week as well. Um, they're all virtual, and then the AFTO conference is just in a few short weeks um, in mid-June this year in Virginia. So hopefully we'll see you there. Um, so thanks again for joining today. We've got a great agenda set up for today. And I've got the agenda here on this slide. Um, we're gonna start with a little bit of a welcome and some introductions with our co-chairs. And then talk a little bit about our new committee name and mission. If you guys joined us last May, we had um, some conversation about changing our mission. Um, and, and our committee name. So that has been completed and we'll talk a little bit about that. And as always, we'll be reviewing our committee charges. We have six to review. And Adam will be joining us from Kansas. He's gonna give us a small update on the Conference for Food Protection in reference to the Food Defense Work Group. And then to wrap us up today, we'll have an update from Colin from FDA on IA rule updates. There'll be plenty of time for questions and conversation. Um, we encourage you guys to use a chat box. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself, ask questions. We have you guys for about an hour and 15 minutes today. So love to hear from you guys. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'll start with introducing myself if you don't know me already. My name is Summer Williams and I work with the Georgia Department of Agriculture. I am the Rapid Response Team Program Manager and Recall Coordinator. I've been with GDA for about a year and a half, almost two years at this point. Um, previous to my work in Georgia, I worked for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Um, as the emergency response coordinator with their food safety division um, since 2016. And prior to that, I worked in the law enforcement division. So I have a heavy background in emergency response. So food defense is near and dear to my heart. Um, I worked two Super Bowls while I was um, with Florida as well. So um, I'll go ahead and kick it off to my co-chair, Dr. Derek Payne. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Derek Payne. I am president of a company called the Food Safety Doctor LLC. LLC. Uh, we provide consulting for food safety and food defense to, to the industry. Uh, we also do training. I'm a lead instructor for an intentional adulteration vulnerability assessments. Uh, prior to becoming uh, part of the Food Safety Doctor LLC, I was senior manager of food safety for the Coca-Cola refreshments division for Coca-Cola here in the U.S. And then I was director of global quality and food safety for Tate and Lyle uh, for quite a number of, year, of years prior to that. Uh, and have developed food defense programs for both of those organizations. And I'm going to hand it off to Jennifer. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Pjarki. Uh, I'm the SAFER deputy director and I work for AFTO. And I am the liaison. Uh, for this group and former chair, as many of you might recall. So thank you so much for attending today. Thanks, Jenny. Yes, Jenny could not escape us. She has now become our AFTO liaison. <laughs> um, those of you may have remembered um, Dr. John Martin from DHS. He actually retired earlier this calendar year. Um, so he was our previous co-chair with our group. So now Dr. Payne has joined us and we're super excited about that. Um, so yeah, so let's go ahead and kick it off and talk a little bit about our committee name and mission. So as you guys probably remember, it used to be called the AFTO um, Food Protection and Defense Committee. And we went ahead and just dropped the uh, food protection part and just dropped it to food defense committee. So that has been approved. Um, as you guys may know, every time we have some sort of change um, that we come together with our committee and, and vote on, we then take those changes and um, those proposals and um, go towards the AFTO board with what we are proposing to change and they have to vote to approve them. So 
this uh, March, I believe, we to the spring, spring, spring board meeting, we took our proposed changes um, and those were approved. Um, so our committee name has officially been changed to the Food Defense Committee. And along with that, we, if you were on last year's meeting, we had a discussion about changing our mission. Um, this is our new mission. I'll read it out loud to educate, share, and make recommendations on food defense issues and non food board incidents impacting the food and ag sector. Um, and really, we're just trying to focus more on non food borne incidents and more on just food defense specific issues. Um, we have several other committees within AFTO, and some of them had some overlap with us. And um, you know, the foodborne outbreak and emergency response committee is, is kind of like our sister committee. Um, so we kind of wanted to separate ourselves out from that. So this is what we agreed upon and it has been approved. So yay. All right, so we've got six committee charges. I'm gonna go through each of those and talk a little bit about what's going on. Um, I will say probably the last time you guys joined us, we had seven and we actually did some editing to some of our committee charges um, and actually combined two into one. So now we're down to six. Um, the first charge is monitoring food and ag sector activities at DHS and government coordinating council and sector coordinating council, otherwise known as the GCC and SCC and reporting any items impacting AFTO members to the board as encountered. Um, this is a committee charge that always stays with our group. Um, Dr. John Martin was a part of our, um, of our committee prior to him leaving. We have not um, selected an actual like DHS representative for our committee yet. Um, that is still in the works. But um, along with Dr. John Martin, um, Jenny and myself have also attended these, um, these DHS meetings um, in the past, and um, they usually happen every spring and fall. Um, here recently after the pandemic, they've gone to a virtual aspect. Um, so the spring meeting actually was in April. And we had some various committee members that attended. There were no major food defense issues brought up during that virtual meeting. Um, we don't have any dates set for the fall meeting yet. Um, so there's really not much to really update you guys on charge one. All right, charge two, developing a webinar for food defense issues. Um, this is a charge that we're currently still working on. I want to be, give a big thanks to uh, Dr. Andrani Deo, who actually volunteered um, this spring to help assist with this charge. Um, we also welcome anyone in the committee who has any like riveting ideas for food defense webinars. Um, if you guys have any great ideas, let us know because uh, we're still working on this one. Um, or if you have any um, anyone that could present for this uh, food defense webinar, let us know as well. And I'll drop my email address in the chat when I'm done talking about the charges, just in case anything perks your mind and you want to send me an email. And Dr. Payne and Jenny, if you want to drop yours in as well. Um, but yeah, we plan on getting this going um, probably in the summertime having a, a webinar. And this would be a webinar that um, kind of similar to this where Acto hosts a Zoom link and um, it's open to the public for anyone to join and it would be a free webinar. All right, charge three. This one is near and dear to my heart. Um, connect and collaborate with the Coalition of Food Protection Task Forces to share food protection and food defense resources. I will say it's near and dear to my heart because I am the liaison for this charge. <laughs> Um, I also, with my work with the Georgia Department of Agriculture, I am the um, Georgia Food Protection Task Force uh, leader in the state of Georgia. So um, I work in, in this realm and I am the liaison for this charge. Um, basically what this is, is I, I wanted to put this map on here so you guys could kind of get a visual of what the task force group is, just in case you're not aware. But um, the states that you see in green, they are federally funded through the FDA 
with a grant for task force. And what that is, is it's grant funding that um, assists the states with having um, a way to collaborate and communicate with industry partners. Um, so it gets the regulators and the industry partners and the academia partners all together within the state where they can sit down and meet and train together and have those conversations and communication um, portals together. So the Coalition of Food Protection Task Forces is actually just a group of all of the leaders from all of those green states working together to meet um, quarterly. And what we do is we have webinars, we have virtual meetings where we all talk about hot topics or maybe things that we talked about at our last meeting, things like that. Um, so with me being the liaison for this charge, I go to those meetings quarterly and bring back any of that information to our committee. Um, I will say we are working to change the coalition up a little bit more. Um, and I actually, on the flip side, has, have also been asked to be a peer leader for the coalition. So I'm working alongside um, other state task force leaders. So you've got Mark Buxton from Missouri, Lorenda from Alaska, Michelle Boyd from Iowa. And we're all working together um, alongside Graham Geeson from FDA and Randy Treadwell from AFTO. And we're coming up with ideas and topics that we think we can bring to our coalition group and share on a quarterly basis. Um, this was kind of a new idea within 2023 to have like a peer led group with some of these state partners. And we actually just kicked off our first meeting. Um, it was last week or the week before. Um, for our quarterly meeting, we actually coordinated with AFTO and with FDA and CIFSAN to have a sesame allergen labeling webinar um, for the coalition partners. It went really well. We were so happy to see it. Um, and it actually coincides with the new FDA's draft compliance policy guide for the major food allergen labeling and cross contact guidance that they just released. Um, and I will also drop a link to that just in case you guys are interested in hearing more about that. Um, the draft guidance that got released is actually open for comment for 60 days. I think it's open through um, maybe July 15th or so. Um, so they're open to taking any comments on the sesame allergen labeling and um, any comments can be uh, taken at regulations.gov. So I'll drop some more information in the chat box about that as well. So basically things like hot topics like the sesame allergen and, and things like that, that would help our task forces ar around the nation. Um, we're just taking that information and sharing those resources um, with our task force group. So that's what's been going on with the coalition of task forces. All right, charge four. So this is one that we kind of changed up a little bit from last year. We had two different charges that were very similar and we kind of combined them into one. Um, and I will say we've been doing a lot of work with this one. Um, charge four is reviewing and collaborating on food defense materials within the food code and FSMA IA rule. Um, we've got a working group of SMEs developing these resources. So we actually are really, Thankful, we got a great group of SMEs. I think we have about 10 in the group. Um, we've got folks from local, state, industry, academia. We've got someone from DHS in the group as well. I will say we are um, still looking for some folks from USDA and FDA. So if you are on this call and you're interested in joining and you work for FDA or USDA, or if you know someone that might be interested, let us know. Um, our plan is to start looking at FDA and USDA food defense materials. Um, we were potentially looking at maybe having like a one pager with resources to share from the, both of the federal partners. Um, additionally, we talked about starting to look into topics like risk assessments and vulner vulnerability assessments um, with food defense as well. So um, we're getting this kicked off. We've met twice already. Uh, we wanted to uh, have this meeting and get any other ideas that you guys might have. I see the chat box is going. I'll have to read that in a little bit. Um, if you're interested in joining our SME group, let me know. 
we can add you in. You, it doesn't matter if you're if you're already a local state or industry or academia person. That's okay. We'll we'll take more. I'm super excited that we have a big group for this. Um, we plan on meeting again probably late June after AFTO. All right, um, charge five. So charge five is reviewing food code food defense documents um, and other related materials with an SME group focusing on retail SMEs. So this one differs a little bit from charge four. This one's more of a focus on retail. Um, we had put this charge on hold at the beginning of this calendar year because we wanted to hear a little bit more about what happened at CFP this spring. And I told you a little bit earlier that Adam is going to speak on um, CFP and food defense work group discussion. So I'll, I'll leave most of this conversation to Adam. But, um, you know, if you're interested in kicking off this work group, we don't have a group of SMEs yet for this. We just kind of wanted to put this one on hold until CFP is complete. So again, we will be asking for any retail SMEs for this charge as well. Um, and I won't steal Adam's thunder. I'll let him talk a little bit about the food defense uh, work group from CFP um, in just a little bit. Um, and so our last charge is charge six. This one is developing the concept for building a planning P training tool. And we're really excited to kick this one off. We're going to actually be working with our partners at FDA in the um, rapid response team program. Um, for those of you that have RRTs in your states, um, you might be familiar with Travis Goodman and Lisa and Quinn from the RRT program. Um, we're gonna work alongside with them and also with Randy Treadwell from AFTO. Um, so we've already kind of gathered a group of SMEs to help kick this off. Um, right now we've got Scion from Fairfax County. We've got some folks from Michigan RRT, um, Minnesota RRT and Georgia RRT to work on this. And what we plan on doing is building a resource tool um, for sharing in Food Shield. For those of you that have never used Food Shield before, Food Shield is a, an online portal where you can sign in and share documents with each other. And it's really helpful because you can share documents outside of your, um, you know, if someone doesn't work within your agency or whatever, sometimes it's hard to share documents and, and all that. So Food Shield's a great portal to use for this kind of thing. And um, they're gonna help us build this on Food Shield. So this is a, a coming soon charge. Um, and again, if you're interested in joining in, we'll totally take more volunteers to help us out with this as well. Um, if you're interested in ICS and planning, fun stuff, join in on the fun, let us know. Um, okay, so those were our six charges. Before we move on to Adam, I think I wanna maybe see what's in the chat box. Um, thank you, Derek, for dropping your email. Awesome. Thank you, Adrani. Yes, if you're interested, Sally, if you're interested in participating in any of these groups, totally still room for fun. Um, I'll drop my email address in the chat box and you can um, shoot me an email with which groups you're interested in joining and we'll, we'll add you in. All right, oh, the planning P tool. Great question, Anna. So the planning P, if, if anyone's familiar with um, the incident command system, ICS, it's a, a tool that is used during emergency response and it helps with making, with organizing a disaster or any sort of emergency response. Um, it's a great management system for organizing the event and how you handle um, your operations, sending your operations staff out into the field to handle whatever the response is, um, planning for the next operational period, um, logistics of getting whatever resources you need out in the field and making the whole event process a lot easier. So um, that is the incident command system. The planning P is actually um, 
it's literally a P that has a step-by-step -step process of working through an event and an operational period with your incident group and um, getting to those next steps in an organized manner and planning for the next operational period, which is usually, it depends, but usually like the next 24 hours or whatever that may be. Um, so it's kind of hard to explain if, you, if you're not familiar with ICS, but it is a, a tool that is, once you get the, the grasp of it, it's really helpful, but it is something that you definitely have to train on when you have emergency response and you have a, an incident. Um, so we want to help guide folks out with having those resources and those tools and those trainings so people can help um, learn more about the ICS process and how to use it. You're welcome. Oh, thank you, Tara. Yes, FEMA, FEMA, if you go to FEMA.gov, the National Incident Management System, NIMS, there's all kinds of free trainings on incident command system. Yes, we, and Jorge, we will get you, um, I'll, I'm going to drop my email address right now in the chat box. If you guys are interested in joining any of these groups, you just shoot us an email and we'll get you going. Awesome. Okay. I think I got the chat box. We can, we'll have more time too later on if you guys think of any more questions. Um, Summer, I think Indrani wanted to introduce uh, Stephen Wagner. Oh, okay, great. I'm sorry, I missed that. Thank you. Yes, go right ahead. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, so after my last month's meeting with uh, Summer, uh, you know, I was inspired to go look for additional resources within our company. So my company is BASF, and as you know, we uh, we make food ingredients, but we also make chemicals. Uh, I'm very familiar with food defense, so I appeal to uh, you know uh, the broader organization for their support, and also a shout out to. Uh, Colin Barthel, who is amazingly on the call today. <laughs> so I'd met him a long time ago in one of the AFTO meetings, and uh, he actually had explained to me uh, some of the depth of BSF's involvement in food defense. So sure enough, uh, I found uh, my colleague Stephen Wagner, uh, who uh, used to actually be with CBP, right, uh, I think before, and has been always supporting us on all things FDA, CBP, everything in our unit. So Stephen, if you're on and if you have your uh, mute button off, please do introduce yourself. <laughs> sure, thank you, Indrani. No, uh, my name is Steve Wagner. I'm an attorney with BASF. I've uh, been uh, with BASF a little over five years but practicing in the um, FDA regulatory arena for going on 20 years now. Um, and then I also spent about five years as an attorney with U.S. Customs and Border Protection in the uh, Miami office. And uh, again, I just, I, my, my role is to provide regulatory support to, among other groups, the, uh, the, the, the food production team at BASF. And so I support them with the full range. And, you know, it includes everything from foods to uh, medical foods, dietary supplements, animal foods, et cetera. So it's the full range, flavors, uh, aromas, those sorts of ingredients. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a privilege to, to be part of this group or to, to join in this activity. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. I appreciate hearing from you. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off to Adam. If there's no further questions, and I'll keep watching this chat box. Thanks, Summer. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, just give a brief update on this. Uh, pretty excited about the the result, and so I'll just start with a little background. Um, the 2020 Conference of Pre-Protection, which is of course the organization that uh, gives 
guidance and recommendations, considers updates to the food code, among other things, gives those to the Food and Drug Administration for their consideration. Um, in 2020, APTO submitted an issue. Somebody named Stephen Mondernock was the issue per, uh, submitter and requested that the, the Conference of Food Protection Food Defense Committee be reestablished with some charges. And that made it through that commit the uh, conference process and was established as a, an ad hoc committee, as they call it. And it was, ended up uh, coming out of the mix with four charges. And those charges were um, do, do, do. Sorry, just uh, here we go. Hold up another link there. Okay, yeah, so the charges were identify current food defense references to be included in the appendix to section four of the model food code to make sure that those were um, up to date for food defense references in the food code annex. Um, recommend whether an additional knowledge area under demonstration knowledge was uh, was appropriate relating to food defense. Report the committee's findings back to some of the formal stuff, the normal stuff you do with the committee. Report it back to the bi next biennial meeting, and then to make sure that we were working closely with FDA food defense and emergency coordination staff and CIFSAN. So those are the charts that came out. We had some some nice organic offshoots of that. Uh, it was a really robust committee process. Had a lot of great discussion. I uh, had two co-chairs that were really wonderful in their organizational abilities and shepherded through um, a, a pretty pretty large task and had a lot of really good outcomes. I think that fast forward into this year's biannual meeting of, of CFP, and you'll see that the fruits of that labor were, were really good. The issues went through all as submitted, which is a big deal. So the report, not a big deal, but we got a couple of key things um, through. The main one, was the addition of a couple of, uh, or rec recommending the FDA add a couple of um, items to um, the food code. And sorry, just pulling up the tabs here and there. I was doing some more research and they got lost on me. Um, but yeah, the uh, issues did make it through as submitted. So we're going to add requested that they add not only a demonstration of knowledge area, but also a responsibility of the person in charge to be able to describe food defense activities, and then also to add a definition of food defense into the food code. So um, the committee went a little bit beyond the initial letters of the, the, the charges, but I think it was in good spirit of saying, well, if we're gonna say, yes, it's appropriate, we should present some options for consideration. And in fact, a lot of the committee members said, we don't really feel that we can recommend whether it's appropriate or not if we don't have something to, to vote on. So that was just an organic offshoot. And then another um, nice development out of that committee work was a, um, a job aid. And I'll pop that link in the chat. It's draft status right now, still officially, but um, not sure. Um, Ask Dr. McSwain if he had any idea when it might happen to be uh, timeline for publishing onto the CFP website. And he said it should be, you know, relatively soon, but I'll go ahead and pop the, the draft of that guidance document in. So this is just an employee orientation checklist that was a work product of the committee. And so it's basically was saying, here's a, if you don't have anything and you just want to pick something up and to start with, this will be a nice little um, one page checklist that you could use for say a new employee orientation and just, just get people an introduction to food defense and the things that are gonna be important on a day-to-day -day basis of just keeping that in mind because there's continues to be ongoing issues with food defense, of course. And that's why one of the reasons we're all here. So that was nice. I think with that, plus the recommendation for FDA to consider the additions to the food code, um, I think those are really positive. So all in all, it was a, good, a really good experience, really good outcome, a, a good demonstration of, of collaboration amongst all the, the various stakeholders that have a vested interest in this arena. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, uh, but I'd be happy to try to answer those. Again, positive success. I'd say if you're thinking about moving ahead, a couple of items popping in my head. If, there, if you felt like there's anything that 
needed to, to extend in the food code again or some other area, maybe in program standards at the retail side, you know, you could, it would it'd probably take a, a re-request, a request to re reestablish the food defense committee over there. Um, but short of that, it might be worth taking that CFP committee roster and just seeing if there's any folks that might be good to cross link with from, from our crew here at the APTO side and just to maintain those relationships and maybe build some new ones. So relationships have shelf life, so it's good to, to keep those fresh and then uh, develop the new ones that come out and all that good stuff. So if there's no questions or if there are, I'll be hanging out. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Adam. Are you the actual work group lead? Um, and I forgive me, I've never been to CFP before, so I don't really know how it works. Is oh yeah, CFP is like nothing else. No, we had um, Albert Espinosa from HEB okay. was one co-chair and then Jennifer Bonsky from Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development was another co-chair. So okay. the, uh, uh, my, new, my favorite saying I heard years and years ago was wheelbarrow full of frogs. And I wish I could attribute that to someone, but they, they did a great job pushing that wheelbarrow and keeping everybody moving along. And um, it's just really robust discussion. Got so many good viewpoints and um, questions, concerns, practical challenges, and was able to come out with, a, I think, a real positive outcome overall. Awesome. Thank you. Any questions for Adam? So, Adam, the, the CFP Food Defense Committee has sunsetted and has completed their work uh, as far as, you know, I guess the councils are concerned. Yeah, so this was it before council too, if you if you like to have this structure and understand that of, of CFP, but it, uh, this was a committee out of council too. And yeah, the, the charges that were presented were completed and the recommendation of the committee was to uh, disband the committee, not reconvene it. So, you know, that's something that, that might be debatable as the charges were presented it seemed like that was um, the right decision at the time but again anything else or any other viewpoints there there could be a, a question to reestablish that it would be a couple of years before it would even get uh considered at the next biennial meeting so Correct. Again, again it was so, sorry adam like uh, lauren is asking a question it was it's council two um that you guys presented to correct yes council two thanks so much for your work adam on this and coming back to the committee and letting us know i i do think um that list that offered was is a great one and if you could uh, provide that list back to summer uh, who participated in the cfp food defense group that would be really helpful yeah, I, I think I saw John Woody was on, and I uh, recall John was was uh, also a valuable contributor um, in that FDA perspective on on our meetings as well. So yeah, a good group that was convened for that. And I'll definitely pop that link in the chat somewhere that has that roster. Thank you. Great. Okay. All right. Well, next up. We've got Colin from FDA. He's going to talk a little bit about the IA rule um, and some updates. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. So, Colin, you can take over the PowerPoint. All right. Just want to do a quick sound check, make sure I'm coming through clear. Sounds great. Great. All right. Now, let me get this full screen here. Okay. All right. Um, as Sarah mentioned before at the beginning of the meeting, my name is Colin Barthel. I am with FDA's Food Defense and Emergency Coordination staff. And I also serve as the SIPSAN um, implementation manager for the intentional adulteration rule. And I've got uh, co partners over on ORA uh, that help me implement this rule uh, from the inspectional standpoint. And so I wanted to give you all a quick update on where we stand. Those of you who are uh, kind of the food defense points of contact with your, within your company, um, I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of the content that I'm going to present, uh, but I also want to give you uh, some uh, kind of a, a 
expectation setting for the next few years of our implementation plan uh, so that nothing catches you by surprise as we move into kind of I, I, what I say is our medium phase of implementation strategy. So I always love speaking to this committee because everybody here is so familiar with the subject matter. So I can run through the background slides pretty quick and then we can kind of get to the, uh, the real nature of what I think you'll probably be interested in. But just in case, if there are any new members uh, to the committee or those who haven't been following kind of the food defense regulatory space very closely, I uh, just like to level set everybody with what the intentional adulteration rule requires. You all know that it is one of the seven FISMA foundational rules. Uh, FDA was directed by Congress within FISMA to, to uh, pass regulation in the area of food defense. And so the intentional adulteration rule is the result of that rulemaking regulatory process. So the rule requires that firms covered by the rule uh, develop a written food defense plan. And that food defense plan needs to have these five critical components. Certainly, it can have uh, more content than what these minimum components are, but that plan needs to have these components in writing uh, within that plan. And so when we go out and conduct um, what we call food defense plan quick checks, which I'll talk about in just a moment, uh, we're looking to make sure that the plan has these five sections in it, and we're just determining whether the facility has uh, developed content in these five areas. Um, and in a little bit, I'll talk about what we're doing kind of to go beyond the quick checks in the future. Uh, the plan also requires uh, a reanalysis. So periodically, that plan needs to be reanalyzed. Um, it needs to be reanalyzed at a minimum of every three years, but if you've also made changes to your facility that would outdate the plan or make the plan inaccurate, such as if you put in a new processing line or something like that, you would need to conduct a reanalysis on any of the relevant parts of the plan impacted by that change. Uh, FDA can also require a reanalysis if we come into information uh, that we think is of sufficient importance that we would uh, flow down to industry and have them reanalyze their food defense plan based upon what that information might be. Um, so you can think of a scenario whereby if FDA came into information whereby uh, we thought that there was a threat to the food supply, we might uh, require firms, a subset of firms or the entire industry to reanalyze their plan based upon this new information. So that's just a scenario that, that we have authority to require a reanalysis within. Also, records need to be maintained. This is, I'm sure, shocking to nobody. Um, management records, like monitoring records, uh, to make sure that mitigation strategies are being implemented, those need to be maintained. Training records need to be maintained, et cetera. So pretty standard pace for any kind of regulatory system that FDA has. And then we also do have a training requirement um, for food defense awareness training, and then individuals that conduct certain responsibilities within the food defense system that that facility is implementing need to be qualified. And so they can be qualified through training. That's probably the most common way to become qualified, but they can also be qualified through job experience um, or other education. Um, Dr. Payne mentioned that he went through the IAVA course uh, for trainers. I actually was his instructor in that course. So that's a perfect example of uh, how someone who's conducting vulnerability assessments that go beyond the key activity type approach um, can be qualified to perform that vulnerability assessment. So that's uh, a way to be qualified through that training. So now that we got through kind of the down and dirty background of what the IA rule is, um, I wanna talk about our inspection system and where we stand today. Uh, we have what we call a two level inspection approach. And I like to term this as broad but shallow coupled with narrow and deep. The food defense plan quick check is broad but shallow. It is conducted across the entirety of our coverage space. Um, so as any facility that is being inspected under their normal food safety programs that FDA regulates, they would have a food defense plan quick check conducted upon them. 
Um, and this would be conducted at a very high level. So a presence absence type of verification that the food defense plan has been developed and that it has those five critical components that I mentioned in the previous slide. This is currently ongoing. Um, we have performed almost a thousand quick checks to date. Uh, we have um, really kind of gotten our legs underneath us. Um, I always like to describe the, uh, I call it a, a very sad historical irony um, that we were scheduled to start our food defense plan quick checks in March of 2020. We actually issued our field assignment to ORA um, three days before the uh, kind of the world shut down from the pandemic. So it was, it was like I say, this terrible historical irony that that we had worked so hard to get these quick checks put into place and train our investigators for it, and literally the week that we were going to start them, uh, the pandemic kind of turned the world on its head. So as a result, through 2020, um, ORA was in a a really kind of a a triage situation, so that we were. Um, responding to areas only of highest risk so that we were not sending investigators into firms um, unless it was absolutely necessary to limit the spread of not only individuals, um, certainly, but also uh, the virus. And so it really did have an impact on our inspectional activities and our quick checks in particular. And so over the past two years, we really have gotten our feet underneath us. And so the majority of those thousand quick checks ballpark that I mentioned uh, have really only happened since FY 21, 22 and up to halfway through 23. So we do have a good tempo going. The next segment, which I term narrow but deep, um, are these food defense inspections. And these are conducted at um, prioritized facilities where we think there is an elevated level of concern uh, for intentional adulteration or the consequences of an intentional adulteration were it to be attempted. And so uh, these firms are going to be identified through a uh, risk-based food defense specific analysis. And before you ask, uh, this analysis will not be public, certainly, because it could highlight vulnerabilities within the system. Um, I've had that question brought up to me uh, multiple times when I've made presentations on these inspections. And I think people in this committee would understand that we can't publicize our, our methodology for identifying uh, firms that we think have a food defense uh, elevated concern. So I think, I think that would probably be natural to folks on this call. These food defense inspections will be conducted by specially trained investigators. This is different than the food defense plan quick check, which is gonna be conducted by our entire human food uh, field staff. That entire human food field staff has undergone training to conduct the quick checks, but it really doesn't get down into the level of detail needed to critically evaluate the food defense program at a facility, determine whether that vulnerability assessment is appropriate, whether mitigation strategies are suitable, et cetera. So the food defense inspections will be conducted by a specialized group of trained investigators that will undergo advanced food defense training and will work within a small group within ORA. And the food defense inspections, like I mentioned, will involve a critical evaluation of that food defense plan to make sure that the conclusions that the facility has come to in their vulnerability assessment and their identification of mitigation strategies are conveying an appropriate level of protection. And what that rationale is uh, that the facility is depending upon represents the reality of what that processing environment is uh, entails. So it's uh, a much greater level of, um, I would say, intensity than what the food defense plan quick checks are. So I talked about this for a little bit. The food defense plan quick check really looks at that one site or that one section of the IA rule that focuses on the contents of the food defense plan. So if you want to go back and look at that and really get um, a refresher on what that section is, it's section 121 of the um, of the rule, um, subsection 126, and that spells out letter for letter um, what the food defense plan 
needs to have within it. And so that's what the, uh, the food defense plan quick check is looking at. This is visual on site. We're collecting no records. So no food defense plans have been gathered by the agency to date from industry. And at the same time, this is a double bonus. It provides us with an interface with that facility um, to potentially get a sense of if they are familiar with the rule and if they need some additional resources. We can provide them with uh, our IA rule guidance, fact sheets, direct them to additional training if they need. And so it really is a good touch point between the agency and uh, industry with regard to the IA rule and food defense in general, because a lot of our resources can convey information and a lot of good lessons learned beyond simply the strict confines of the IA rule. So it is a good nexus where we, as regulators and FDA SMEs, can uh, communicate with industry. I do want to bring up uh, that we are working with our state partners. Um, Right now, we are uh, having our state partners to help uh, establish our inventory and refine what the, uh, the number and type of covered firms are uh, within our domestic space, certainly. Um, and so our state contracts include a provision whereby uh, it asks our state partners to determine whether a firm is covered or not, and then um, we will go back and... Uh, add that into our uh, official establishment inventory that the agency holds so that we know which firms we need to include in our work planning in the future. Uh, no observations are included in our state contracted work um, and the states are also able to provide training resources uh, to industry that they uh, interact with. So here's a quick uh, schedule of inspections before I get into a little bit more detail on our food defense inspections. We technically started food defense plan quick checks in March of 2020, but as I mentioned, there was a disruption there. Um, and now we are kind of running on at a good pace. Um, and this second bullet point is actually still our original plan and on original schedule. We had always planned on performing the quick checks for a number of years before we move into implementing that limited focused food defense inspection program. We're in the middle of building that program now, and we anticipate starting these inspections at the very end of FY24 or the beginning of FY25. So that's right in line with what our original plan was. Um, so luckily we were able to use our time when the quick checks were kind of on a slow burn because of the pandemic to develop um, some of our resources and focus some of our resources on developing the food defense inspection system. And so I'll move into that uh, a little bit um, in just a moment, but I wanted to give you a quick uh, heads up on what we're seeing. What are some of the trends that we're seeing from the food defense plan quick checks? We are seeing a good rate of compliance, which is good to know. Um, we're seeing that the vast majority of firms that we visit are familiar with the rule and that they have undertaken the effort to develop that food defense plan. The use of the IA rule guidance seems to be beneficial. Um, we have uh, seen that the key activity types are the most predominant method for vulnerability assessments, which means that in order to use the key activity types and be familiar with that methodology, the individuals developing the food defense plan needed to have read the guidance and understand it. And so, I think the inference that using the key activity types is beneficial is because of the uh, majority of firms are using them now. Now, what does that tell us? I think that tells us um, a couple of things. One, I think that industry finds the key activity type approach to be useful and resource efficient because of the way that they are described within guidance. Um, this is also in line with our expectation. We would have expected that the key activity types would have been used as the earliest method or the first method for industry to conduct their vulnerability assessment. We expect that as firms go through their reanalysis portions, uh, as uh, you know, that three-year time frame kind of rolls over into the future, we expect that industry will generally move into more of a hybrid approach, coupling the key activity types with a more um, specialized analysis 
whereby they can determine um, a little bit more um, specificity with some of their potential actionable process steps by using this hybrid approach. Um, we expect to see that happen. We'll just have to see if the data plays out uh, in the future as to if that's an evolution that will happen in industry. Um, but we did anticipate that the key activity types would be predominantly used in the early part of food defense plan development. And we are um, asking our CSOs when they go out into industry, if there is a method that is not key activity types being used, um, just to make a note of that, um, because that could be important as we come back into comprehensive food defense inspections, um, if we want to know how many um, facilities are using a different type of vulnerability assessment method, or if there's a certain um, segment of industry, a certain type of product, uh, for example, that are using different vulnerability assessment methods, that would be interesting for us to know uh, at, in the future. So we're asking our CSOs to kind of gather some of that um, anecdotally as they're going out doing the food defense plan quick checks. Now, a little bit of more detail for the food defense inspection. As I mentioned, this is a much more detailed um, investigatory, or not investigatory, pardon me, wrong word, a much more uh, detailed regulatory activity. So we're going in, we're going to be determining the adequacy of that plan, as I mentioned, but we're also going to be assessing the implementation status of that plan. So we're going to be conducting facility walkthroughs. We're going to be essentially mapping the plan to what is going on on the facility floor uh, to make sure that the firm is uh, conducting themselves in the way they have written up uh, that they should be behaving in the food defense plan. And as I mentioned, this will be conducted by CSOs with specialized food defense training uh, within a specialized group within our human food staff in ORA. And of course, people like me, uh, like John Woody, who's also on the phone, uh, people from SIFSANS Food Defense and Emergency Coordination staff, our SME group will be available for real-time consultation and technical support for our investigators. We're actually envisioning uh, for the first kind of phase of these food defense inspections to conduct those inspections in a teamed format, whereby someone like me would actually go out on the inspection and accompany that CSO that's gone through specialized training. We think that's going to be really important because I think it will make sure that both the SMEs in SIFSAN and the CSOs out in the field conducting inspections are operating from the same frame of reference, that we're on the same page when we come to determinations of adequacy. And we think it will really ensure that uh, industry is getting a consistent message uh, from the agency when we're conducting food defense inspections. And so we're developing our food defense program really with these um, major philosophical foundations in mind. Um, I think everybody on this call knows that information security is absolutely critical in the food defense world, more so than any other aspect of food manufacturing, in my mind. This, uh, a food defense plan is more sensitive than I think any other document that a facility uh, in the food defense, uh, in the food processing environment would create, because it consists of an assessment to determine where the vulnerabilities are present within that firm the nature of those vulnerabilities, and then the mitigation strategies that are being put in place to protect those significantly vulnerable points. That's very sensitive information. And so the agency absolutely understands that, and we're developing our food defense inspection system with that as probably the most foundational um, uh, kind of discipline as we're developing this program. Food defense information needs to be secured when we have to take custody of it for uh, specific reasons. And we're not going to be collecting information um, just for the point of collection. We're gonna be collecting information only when absolutely needed, such as when a novel vulnerability assessment might need to be evaluated by our SME staff. Um, sections of that vulnerability assessment or portions of the plan uh, may be collected so that it can undergo a more uh, appropriate and specialized compliance review. Or if we need to take compliance action, we need to develop sufficient evidence for those compliance actions. And so we would need to take um, appropriate information to um, provide backup for that compliance activity. We are not 
uh, we are not going to be collecting information as a part of routine inspectional activity. Um, only if and when absolutely necessary, and we're developing a system to ensure that that information, when collected by the agency, is held not only within the strictest confidence within the agency, but also segregated from food defense, or pardon me, from food safety information, so that it's not conflated uh, with less secure information, and that it can't be unintentionally or inadvertently um, disclosed or, or transmitted or anything like that. So we're developing a system to, uh, to ensure information security within the program. We also wanna make sure that the consistent application of the IA rule is delivered to industry. So this is part of the specialized training that the CSOs will undergo and the fact that they'll be working within a small specialized staff so that we can have and enforce and manage um, consistent interpretations of adequacy and that the agency is delivering um, consistent rationale and conclusions uh, with regards to any potential compliance action. We think it's critical to consistently apply the rule, um, in particular this rule, because this is the first regulation of its type in the world. So we're really paving new ground um, with regards to food defense regulation. And in order to ensure that that regulation is properly implemented within industry, we need to make sure that the agency is consistently implementing it and its thinking is being delivered clearly and consistently to industry. And so we need to make sure that within the food defense inspections, we're achieving that goal. Uh, and that we're focusing our inspectional resources on prioritized facilities, like I said, where we think the highest um, risk is present within the food safety and defense system. I'm sure everybody on the phone knows that we're dealing with a limited pool of resources uh, for our inspectional programs, and so we need to make sure that we're using those resources wisely. We are delivering to the, uh, to the American taxpayers the most efficient use of government resources, and so we need to undertake a rational science-based prioritization process for our regulatory inspectional activity. So with that, um, just want to give you some links for our uh, additional information. Um, there's also that email address at the bottom, which is uh, goes straight to the food defense staff. Um, it's monitored constantly. Uh, normally, you'll get a response within 24 hours. Sometimes if you're asking something that's of a regulatory nature, like am I doing this okay under the rule? Um, can you give me a little bit of clarity on what this rule requirement might be? We might have to shift that over into a more formalized process, which we call the technical assistance network. And that takes a little bit longer because it needs to go through um, regulatory reviews before we uh, issue the response to those types of questions. But if you're just asking more generalized food defense questions, we normally get back to you within a, a day or so. So uh, happy to take any questions, uh, have some discussion. And Summer, I'll give it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, Derek says, do you have the link to the food defense tool? Yes, I can get, the, let me stop sharing because it's taking all of my screen and uh, I can put that in the chat. Awesome. And Janet has asked if your presentation is available for sharing. Yes, it is. This is one of our uh, public presentations. So you can, uh, I think I've, it really hasn't changed, frankly, a lot from the last time I uh, presented to AFTO. Um, so some of the members might already have uh, essentially this presentation, but it is uh, our public presentation. Okay. Um, and I know that Jessica recorded this um, Zoom. So I know there's some folks that registered that weren't able to make it. So I think we'll be able to share the recording as well. Um, so yeah, we can, sure, uh, we can share it for sure. I just don't know if it's going to be posted somewhere. Okay. on the AFTO website. Um, I'm still working on that for you, but either way, for sure, I'll have a link that you can share it. Awesome. Um, yeah, so what I'll probably do is do a follow-up email after, um, you know, sometime this week, and we can share that recording out with everyone. Um, Minerva has 
Sent a sip sand document. Yeah, food shield. We might be able to share in food shield. I think um, not everyone has access to food shield though. If I, I don't know. I can't remember if industry partners can get into food shield. Um, I put the link there for the plan. Thank builder. you. Thanks. Awesome. We are seeing actually just to add on to that, we are seeing a significant utilization of the plan builder by industry, uh, which is uh, excellent news for us. Um, so one, there's there's two excellent pieces of information for that. One, um, it shows us that industry feels that that tool is helpful uh, to organize their food defense plan and uh, capture the information in kind of a structured way. Um, the second thing is a little bit selfish from the agency standpoint, <laughs> I guess I'll say, is that um, it helps to standardize the, the organization and formatting of food defense plans in a way within industry. And so when our investigators go out and conduct a food defense plan quick check, if they're familiar with the format, uh, because it's, it's built within the food defense plan builder, that just kind of facilitates them going through that document a little bit easier. Um, it's kind of a, a, a an unintended bonus of developing the plan builder, but it does help uh, make the quick check run a little bit more smoothly and more efficiently. Great. Andrani says, how would food defense inspections be handled in foreign facilities supplying food to the U.S. and would it be part of standard ORA inspections outside of the U.S.? Excellent question, Andrani. Good to hear your voice uh, earlier. It was nice to uh, speak with you before. Um, I do want to highlight that we are conducting uh, quick checks in the foreign inspections uh, right now. Um, and so about a third of our quick checks um, have been done in a foreign facility. And so they are bound by the exact same requirements and the quick check is being uh, conducted in the exact same style. Uh, when that foreign facility comes up uh, under an inspection for a food safety program, uh, that foreign inspection includes a food defense plan quick check. And so it's the, it's a completely level playing field uh, with regards to the way that we conduct the quick checks, both domestically and foreign. You got a thank you as well. Awesome. Any other questions? Well, I also, my travel is still going through, but I plan on being at AFTO. So um, by all means, you know, pull me aside, say hi. Uh, happy to chat as always. So thanks so much. Awesome. And on that note, I will give another shout out for AFTO. Um, today is the last day to register for AFTO. Um, if you register past today, there's a $100 late fee. But we are really excited that everyone uh, can hopefully make it to AFTO this year. It is in person. It's in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, June 11th through the 14th. Um, I will drop this link in the chat as well, just in case anyone wants to check out the agenda and go ahead and register um get that in the chat awesome um and that's pretty much all i had today i want to give a big thank you to everyone who attended um we had about 45 people at our top attendance so um dr Payne, anything you want to add in uh, just to thank Colin for uh, participating and, and, and accepting the invitation. The information was really good. One thing I wanted to, is actually a question to you, Colin. Uh, you mentioned uh, foreign suppliers in training for food defense. Would that ever be rolled into the FSBP uh, program as, as a verification for FSBP? Do you know? Uh, good question. Uh, the answer to that is no, because the regulatory requirements are different. Uh, FSVP doesn't have within its um, rule requirements the need to include a food defense uh, verification. Um, certainly, we have heard that industry members, as part of their 
business operations and part of their contract relationships have conveyed food defense requirements onto their suppliers, but it's not a regulatory system that, that is within the FSVP rule. Got it. Again, thank you for um, helping us out today and uh, presenting. Absolutely. Good to see you, Derek. Yeah, nice to see you again. <laughs>